College and the name of our college, Rhode Island University. His illustrious career began with being adjusted as the best cadet and winning the operated telescope during sea training. Then he was commissioned in the Navy on 1st January 1975 with the sole of honor of his course. He was then also selected as the one of the pioneer uh, sea harrier that uh, sea harrier, you know, the Indian Navy traffic sea harriers. And he was one of the basic uh, pioneer in, the, in that uh, sea harrier dietary course, which he did in UK and thereafter during his tenure in India, Naval Air Squadron 300 and the aircraft carrier different. He shaped the future of the direction specialization in the Indian Navy. His important staff appointments uh, include uh, in the Naval Headquarter, uh, Deputy Director of Naval Operations, Joint Director of Naval Plans, Assistant Chief of Naval Staff Policy and Plans, and the Deputy Chief of Naval Staff Integrated Headquarters in the Ministry of Defense Navy. The Admiral has commanded three frontline portions of the Western Fleet, and he also had the proud privilege to command the Eastern Fleet as the flag officer commanding the Eastern Fleet. Besides serving as Indian Naval Advisor at the High Commission of India, London, he also served as Chief Staff Officer Operations of the Western Naval Command, uh, which is based in Mumbai, and the Chief of Staff at Headquarters Eastern Naval Command, which is based in Visakhapatra. And then, of course, subsequently, he had the distinction to command his alma mater, the National Defense Academy, as the commandant. The Admiral assumed the charge of the Vice Chief of Naval Staff in August 11 and was promoted to be the 22nd Chief of the Naval Staff of Indian Navy on 17th April 2014. And it was in 2015, of course, during the first study that he was here. Uh, he retired on 31st May 2016 and on 25th November 2016, he took over as the fifth chairman of the National Maritime Foundation in short, NMF in New Delhi, which is India's prime, prime, one prime maritime think tank. Sir, welcome to the National Defense College once again, and the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, that we know. the appreciating commandant at the National Defense College, members of the senior directing staff, members of the directing staff, course members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is indeed a distinct honor and a proud privilege for me to be present here again to address this August gathering which represents the collective wisdom of the armed forces of Bangladesh and other armed forces under one roof. As you're aware, I'll be speaking to you on India's a resurgent maritime nation harnessing the blue economy and avenues for cooperation with Bangladesh. I'm aware that uh, you're going, doing your phase of international relations and I'm sure this talk will provide you some insight on the relation between two maritime neighbors, India and Bangladesh, and the maritime cooperation that India has with other countries in the world. The subject of my talk is related to the seas and the oceans. And while this enthuses all of us who have donned the white uniform, I'm sure that the subject would be of equal interest to all others as well, because we are all tied and connected to the oceans. And I would like all of you to reflect on an interesting biological fact that we all have in our veins the same percentage of salt in our blood which is the exact same percentage of salt in the oceans. And this is true, not only about the salt in our blood, but also the salt in our sweat and in our tears. 
We are all therefore tied and connected to the oceans. And whenever we go back to the seas, whether to watch them or sail on them, we get the feeling of going back where we came from. This truly defined the relationship of humankind with the oceans and perhaps also the reason why talking about the seas brings out such passion in us. Our blue planet, the Earth, has a dominance of the maritime domain with over 70% of the Earth's surface covered by water, nearly 80% of the world's population living within 200 nautical miles of the coast, and 90% of the world's trade transiting by sea. India is essentially a maritime nation, and the waters of India have been the vortex of intense maritime activity over centuries. The Indus Valley Civilization, which existed in the western part of the country, dates back to 3300 BC. Even today, we have a dry dock at Lothal in Gujarat, which dates back to 2200 BC. It is from these small ports that ancient seafarers sailed off to distant lands in Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, and east coast of Africa. On the east coast of India, we have the seafaring kingdoms of the Kalinga, the Cholas, Pandyas, and Cheras who sailed off to Southeast Asian countries. And even today, we can see glimpses of India's culture and glorious heritage in these countries. During the British period, that was a period of glorious shipbuilding period in India because the Britishers found a unique combination of the Malabar teak, which is available on the west coast of India, and the shipbuilders of the ground. And with this combination, they started building ships in Bombay docks, which is the exact same location of the naval dockyard at Mumbai today. Many famous ships were built, nearly 150 war vessels, of which 84 were gunships for the Royal Navy, 155 merchant ships. And some of the most famous ships in the world were built during this period. The oldest warship afloat in the world today is Echimistan Kabul, which is currently berthed in Hartapur in the UK, and that ship, ladies and gentlemen, were built in Bombay Docks exactly 200 years ago, 1817. The national anthem of the United States of America, the Star Spangled Banner, was written by Francis Key in Baltimore on board a ship, HMS Minden, and that ship was built in India. The Treaty of 19 ceding Hong Kong to the British was signed on board another famous warship. Exodus on Wallace, also built in Bombay Docks. This glorious worship building tradition continues in independent India even today. Oceans are central to life on Earth. They are rich in oil and mineral resources. They are the suppliers of oxygen, absorbers of carbon dioxide, a virtual heat sink, rich in marine biodiversity, and has emerged as the global economic highways for transit of trade. With the depletion of resources on land, humankind has turned towards the oceans. And there is a misperception that the oceans are an unending resource base and an infinite sink. Nothing could be further away from reality. Over the past few decades, we have witnessed pollution of the oceans and contamination of the rich marine habitat, which has resulted in a detrimental impact of climate change on the oceans. Studies have indicated that nearly 80% of all pollutants in the ocean emanate from land. And if the current rate of pollution continues, in a few decades from now, we will have more plastic in the ocean 
than fish. Harnessing the blue economy has emerged as a new paradigm which calls for optimal utilization of the resources with minimum impact on the environment and ensuring sustained development of the oceans. India and Bangladesh are two great maritime nations with a natural outflow towards the seas. We share common history, common maritime heritage, and our waters have seen extensive activity over centuries. Peninsula India sits astride busy sea lines of communication which transit across the Indian Ocean, over which nearly 100,000 ships transit every year, carrying 66% of the world's oil, 50% of the world's container traffic, and 33% of the world's cargo traffic. Maritime nations, with a natural outflow towards the seas, we share common history, common maritime heritage, and our waters have seen extensive activity over centuries. Peninsula India sits astride busy sea lines of communication, which transit across the Indian Ocean, over which nearly 100,000 ships transit every year, carrying 66% of the world's oil, 50% of the world's container traffic, and 33% of the world's cargo traffic. Bangladesh is located at the northern end of the Bay of Bengal, which is the largest bay in the world. And there are seven countries on the rim of the Bay of Bengal, which are the two neighbors. 94% of Bangladesh's trade runs by sea, and this plays a significant impact and contribution to its economy. India has vast maritime interests, and these have a vital relationship with the nation's economic growth. In recent years, under the leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, Shri Narendra Modi, there have been a series of initiatives and extensive development in the maritime domain, coupled with the transition from the Look East to the Act East policy. It actually appears that India has once again turned towards the seas and is destined to emerge as a resurgent maritime nation. Bangladesh's unique disposition and seafaring tradition has also led to a large number of maritime interests. Oceans and in inland waterways are integral to Bangladesh's economic development, and the government has given great impetus in the seven five year plan for Bangladesh to focus on harnessing the blue economy and has identified specific areas for sustained development which include ecotourism, development of inland waterways, aspects related to harnessing the ocean-based energy, shipbuilding, deep sea fishing, to name a few. India and Bangladesh have also signed a memorandum of understanding on cooperation in the field of blue economy and the ocean-based economy. This provides an ideal environment for promoting avenues of maritime cooperation between India and Bangladesh. India has a long coastline of 7,516 kilometers, an exclusive economic zone of over 2 million square kilometers. 95% of our trade by volume, 72% by value, transits by sea. And this accounts for nearly 50% of the country's GDP. Our maritime interests are therefore also enablers of our blue economy. And I will highlight some of the maritime sectors which are slated for extensive growth in the coming years. And these are also avenues for 
maritime cooperation between India and Bangladesh. India has 12 major ports and over 200 minor and intermediate ports. The current port handling capacity at these ports of 1,400 million metric tons per annum is likely to increase to 2,500 million metric tons per annum over the next 10 years. The government has launched an ambitious Sagar Mala project, which is a port-led development initiative based on four pillars of port modernization, connectivity, port-led industrialization, and coastal community development. Sagar Mala actually comprises about 150 projects with an NSR investment of about 60 to 70 billion US dollars. It looks into aspects of connectivity of major and minor ports, connectivity to the hinterland by the road and rail network, and we are also looking into the aspect of developing the inland waterways. Currently, 94% of the freight in India on land moves by road and rail, and it is well known that movement over water is cheaper, safer, and cleaner. India has about 14,500 kilometers of inland waterways, of which in the first phase, about 4,500 kilometers are being developed as five major national waterways. National Waterway 1 from Haldia to Alabad, up the Ganges River. National Waterway 2 across the Brahmaputra River. National Waterway 3 in the coastal state of Kerala on the west coast of India. Waterway 4 in the coastal state of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. And National Waterway 5 in the coastal state of Orissa. Development of port-led infrastructure could be an ideal area of cooperation between India and Bangladesh. Because Bangladesh is also developing its infrastructure in ports and harbors, and this could be a great opportunity for the two countries to cooperate in. As far as the inland waterways are concerned, Bangladesh is one of the longest inland waterway networks in the world, 24,000 kilometers of inland waterways. And having signed recently the Inland Waterways Trade and Transit Treaty, this is an ideal opportunity for the two countries to look at harnessing this aspect of the blue economy, both for port development as well as the inland waterways. India has a vibrant shipbuilding industry. I mentioned to you the ancient aspects. But now we have 27 shipyards and recently the government has given a major boost to the shipbuilding sector by according it the special infrastructure status to shipbuilding. There's also been induction of technology, setting up of design centers, and the government has also committed 100% foreign direct investment into shipbuilding. This will see further growth in the shipbuilding sector. And an area I would like to mention is that of warship building in India. Independent India constructed its first naval war vessel way back in 1961, INS Ajay at the Garden Beach shipyard in Kolkata. The Indian Navy set up its naval design directorate in 1964. Over the last 50 years plus, our naval designers have been designing and our indigenous shipyards have been constructing ships for the Indian Navy, which has resulted in our transformation from a buyer's navy to a builder's navy. The blueprint of the future Indian Navy is firmly anchored on self-reliance and indigenization. And it's a matter of great pride that all the 40 ships and submarines under construction today are being built in Indian shipyards, both public and private. Not a single ship or submarine is on order on any shipyard abroad. 
And we also have an acceptance of necessity from the government for 60 additional ships and submarines. These range from aircraft carriers to destroyers, frigates, and submarines. Shipbuilding is another avenue of cooperation where we could have joint venture partnerships between the shipyards of the two countries and go in for shipbuilding projects in the future. India has a thriving fishing industry. We have 250,000 fishing boats, 4 million active fishermen, 14 million part of the fishing community. Our annual catch is in the region of 9.5 million tons, which fetches us about 5.5 billion US dollars in foreign exchange. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is only scratching the surface because 85 to 90 percent of fishing in Indian waters is coastal in nature and restricted to about 20 nautical miles from the coast, whereas we have the entire 200 nautical miles to be exploited. There is hardly any fishing in deep Indian waters, and it is said that fish in deep Indian waters are dying of old age. So this is an area of deep sea fishing which is going to see major growth in the coming years to set up deep sea fishing trawlers and once we have the induction of technology these trawlers could be built in our own boatyards and shipyards thousands of them across the country we could have processing platforms or processing of the catch and this whole industry could be modernized but we intend to do this with a very careful eye on the environment to see that it is done in a sustainable way for sustainable development and exploitation of deep sea fishing. This is another avenue for cooperation because Bangladesh has a vibrant fishing industry as well and this could be another area of cooperation between the two countries. India has about 1300 islands and islets as part of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal, the Lakshadweep group of islands in the Arabian Sea, and islands of the west and east coast of India. The government of India has prepared a comprehensive island development plan, taking into account aspects of security, economic sustenance, environment preservation, cultural and social sustenance. It is intended to build greenfield projects and infrastructure in these islands and also promote these islands for controlled ecotourism. Locations across the west and east coast of India are also intended to be developed for marinas and to promote cruise tourism. There are nine projects already underway for cruise tourism to set up the infrastructure with an investment of about $500 million. Opening up of the marine tourism sector would provide a host of opportunities between India and Bangladesh for cruise tourism, coastal tourism, and perhaps even ecotourism in the Sundarbans area. India was allocated an area of 150,000 square kilometers in Central Indian Ocean in 1987 for deep seabed mining by the International Seabed Authority. We were later accorded the pioneer status and a lot of work has happened in terms of mapping the area and the first phase has now been completed and now will be the next phase of exploration of deep sea bed mining uh, in the area allotted to us. We also have <laughs> offshore oil and gas exploration areas off the west and east coast of India. And this sector is also likely to see tremendous growth in the coming years. We have the aspect related to the alternate sources or renewable sources of energy from the oceans. India is the fifth largest market for wind energy, but now the focus is going to be on tidal, wave, 
as well as the ocean thermal energy conversion. The temperature on the surface of the water in the proximity of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands is about 24 to 25 degrees. The temperature at about 1000 meters is 4 to 5 degrees centigrade. When water is pumped out from the depth of about 1000 meters, this temperature differential of 20 degrees is used to evaporate ammonia, run turbines, and generate power under ocean thermal energy conversions. A pilot project is already underway, and this will be another area of renewable sources of ocean energies, which is likely to see growth in the coming years. These sectors also provide an ideal opportunity for cooperation between our two maritime countries. As can be seen, there are a host of opportunities, vast spectrum of activities in which we can cooperate in the maritime domain. But the challenge will be to ensure that these are greenfield <coughs> projects and that to ensure that we carry out in infrastructure development with minimum impact on the environment to sustain development of the oceans. We also look into the area now where the oceans and the seas are no longer a benign medium. And globalization has resulted in vulnerability of the ocean. The threat perception and challenges in the maritime domain are as wide and varied as they come. Who could have imagined that in the 21st century we would once again be grappling with pirates or that the major threats in the maritime domain would be from asymmetric warfare and maritime terrorism. But that is the reality today. And the challenges include <laughs> arms trafficking, drug smuggling, human trafficking, and poaching. The waters of the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean are also prone to natural disasters. And our navies have to be ever ready for rapid response to meet that challenge as well. The Indian Ocean is the third largest water body in the world spanning an area of 68.5 million square kilometers. And the countries on the rim of the Indian Ocean are home to nearly one third of humanity. Having emerged as the global economic highway, we have nearly 120 ships, warships, from about 20 navies which are always present in the Indian Ocean to protect their maritime interests. India has vast maritime interests and the responsibility of protecting these interests falls squarely on the shoulders of men in white uniform because it is the responsibility of the Indian Navy and the Coast Guard to ensure that these maritime interests which have a vital relationship with the nation's economic growth are allowed to develop unhindered at all times. The Indian Navy has grown into a multi-dimensional network force which is ready to take on any challenge in the Indian Ocean region and beyond. It carries out its roles and tasks based on four basic roles, the military role, the constabulary role, the benign role and the diplomatic role. Under the military role, the growth of the Indian Navy is secured under the Maritime Capability Perspective Plan and it is ever ready to take on any contingency or any threat to maritime security and follow the operational policies of sea control by the carrier task forces and sea denial by the presence of submarines. It continuously carries out exercises to hold its skills and increase its operational efficiency to meet the military role. Under the constabulary role, the Indian Navy is responsible for coastal and offshore security, a function that it discharges in coordination with the Coast Guard and with about 
16 agencies that operate in the maritime domain. We carry out regular exercises in all our nine coastal states in both the islands and trees to see that we are ready to meet the challenge of coastal security as well. In recent years, we have leveraged technology and set up 46 coastal radar stations, 87 automatic identification system stations, and we have set up the National Command Control Communication and Information Network, which integrates about 51 stations of the Navy and the Coast Guard to provide a comprehensive maritime domain awareness <coughs> in our waters. The Indian Navy has also continuously deployed since 2008 and sent ships for anti-piracy patrol and coordination with other navies operating in the region there we have managed to bring piracy under some control. We also provide EZ surveillance and EZ patrols in the waters of Mauritius, Seychelles, and Maldives in coordination with the maritime forces of those countries. And we carry out coordinated patrols in the Bay of Bengal with the Myanmar Navy, the Indonesian Navy, and the Thai Navy. As far as the benign role is concerned, the Indian Navy provides humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, not only in our own coastal areas, but to all our literal neighbors. Both in the aftermath of tsunami, they were here in Bangladesh, after the aftermath of Siddhar in 2007, and more recently in the cyclone that existed. We carried out humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, search and rescue operation. And this exemplifies the unique brotherhood of the seas and the abilities of the navies to promote cooperation. In the diplomatic role, the Indian Navy has expanded its operational footprint as far east as Vladivostok, as far west as the Atlantic. And we regularly carry out excitements with various navies of the world. We also have an active cooperation arrangement. We conduct 20 staff talks with various navies. And the aim is to shape a favorable maritime environment in the region by capacity building and capability enhancement. We also have a vibrant cooperation arrangement with the Bangladesh Navy which ranges from regular ship visits, participation in the Milan, which is a regional Navy meet held once every two years. We carry out training interaction in various fields, whether it's submarine training, Gaudian training, or aviation training. And the avenues of cooperation are only going to increase in the coming years. In 2008, the Indian Navy launched a unique initiative of the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, which is a maritime construct for promoting cooperation between navies of the Indian Ocean region. Bangladesh is the current chair of the IONS, and today we have 22 members, and I must commend that Bangladesh's Navy has played a significant role in promoting cooperation between the navies of the Indian Ocean region as the chair of IOMS. We also have the Indian Ocean Rim Association, which is another maritime construct for discussing issues of maritime security and promoting cooperation between the countries of the Indian Ocean region. Incidentally, 20 members of the IORA also have their navies as members of the IONS. And recently there has been a synergy between the IONS and the IORA. To further promote cooperation among navies of the world, the Indian Navy conducted the International Fleet Review last year at Vishakhapatnam on the east coast of India. 50 navies of the world including Bangladesh Navy, got together at Vishakhapatnam to strengthen bridges of friendship. We also conducted a seminar 
on partnering together for a secure maritime future. The underlying theme of the International Fleet to View was that we may be separated by geography, but we are certainly united to the oceans. Speaking at the International Fleet to View, the Honorable Prime Minister of India reiterated his vision for the Indian Ocean as Sagar, which means the ocean, and the acronym stands for security and growth for all in the region. In conclusion, the seas around us are gaining newfound importance as each day goes by, and I have no doubt that the current century is the century of the seas. The Indian Ocean has emerged as the world's center of gravity in the maritime domain. As each day goes by, and I have no doubt that the current century is the century of the seas. The Indian Ocean has emerged as the world's center of gravity in the maritime domain. Another unique feature of the Indian Ocean is that 80% of the oil and trade that emanates in the Indian Ocean is extra regional in nature. This implies that if there is any impediment to the free flow of oil or trade, it will have a detrimental impact not just on the economies of the region, but global economies as well. Safety, security, and stability on the waters of the Indian Ocean is of paramount importance. And it is the collective responsibility of the navies to ensure the security of the global commons. Networking between navies and global maritime partnerships are emerging as the new order of the current century. The cooperation between the Indian Navy and the Bangladesh Navy is likely to grow in the coming years, particularly in the field of information exchange to enhance maritime domain affairs. India and Bangladesh are two maritime nations who have extended their hand across the Bay of Bengal to partner together to harness the blue economy. And I would like to term this as partnership for prosperity. I'm sure that in the coming years, the avenues of cooperation and maritime cooperation between our two great countries will increase, and this will also ensure sustained development of the oceans. Thank you.